Good morning. Good morning. Wow, how about grace? What a testimony. <laughs> so courageous. I love it. Well, good morning, Antioch family. It is great to be with you this morning. And welcome to those of you, if we haven't met yet, if you're visiting, we're so grateful you're here. Sharon and I have been part of the Antioch family for about five years, and we're expectant for God to show up every week, and we pray that's true today. And happy, happy summer, everyone. It's summer, right? People are coming and going everywhere, right? We've got vacations, trips. Two weeks ago, we were in Nashville. Our daughter got asked to be married to. So that is super fun. Uh, obviously, mission trips, we've got the ADS team, they're coming back. I got some early reports that over 60 people surrender their lives to Jesus. Pretty cool. The other thing I love about summers is concerts. Raise your hand if you've been to a concert or you're going to a concert this summer. All right. Concerts are really, really fun. Several years ago, I got tickets to U2. Any U2 fans out there? All right. I have been fans of U2 since college, and they're still performing. So I got my son into U2, and we got, we got tickets to go see them live. And never saw them live. Wanted to go see them live for years. We were so excited to see them. The only tickets I could get, though, were in the very back row of the United Center in Chicago. But I'm like, it doesn't matter. We're there. So I mean, it was so far back that there were the monitors, we need to look at the monitors because we couldn't even really see the stage, but we didn't care. We were happy to be there. And so <laughs> it, did, it didn't matter to us that uh, we were so far back. Well, the first song starts, and I remember I'm in the back row, and I feel this tap on my shoulder. And it's a guy waving some tickets at us. And he, I can hear him through the opening song, and he says, would you like to get tickets closer? And we're like, yeah. So I guess this is a thing they do. They, they gave us these tickets, and we ran down, screaming our heads off. We were 30 feet from the stage. 30 feet. I could almost touch Bono, you know? <laughs> 30 feet from the stage. It was unexpected good news. Does anybody need some unexpected good news today? Yeah. Now, for those of you in the back, I don't have tickets to you 2 for you, OK? <laughs> Sorry about that. We've got some good news. I've got something today. Actually, Jesus has something today that's way more life-changing because you've been given tickets to the front row. You've been given tickets to the front row to hear a message, a life-changing message from the promised Messiah, the Son of God. So this summer, friends, we're journeying through the Gospel of Luke, and we're asking two core questions. The first one is what do we learn about the kingdom of God? And the second one is, why is this good news? So this morning, we drop in, think you've got a parachute on, and you've just been dropped into the first century, into this front row. We've dropped in on an unexpected scene to hear an unexpected message with unexpected good news. We're going to see this morning that Jesus chooses the unexpected heals the unexpected, blesses the unexpected, warns the unexpected, loves the unexpected, and even corrects the unexpected. And he expects us, as his disciples, to live like him so that we can bear fruit and live our lives on a solid foundation. So our message today is simply this, the kingdom of God is unexpected good news. You ready to hear that? So open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 12. Luke 6, verse 12. And please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Luke 6, starting in verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, whom he called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Would you pray with me? Father, good morning. It is so good to be in your presence. 
Thank you that you invite us every day to be in your presence. Holy Spirit, we, we thank you that you are always working, and we pray for you to be moving in our hearts today to do, as we say, what only you can do. And Jesus, of course, <laughs> we're here for you. We exalt your name, and you have the center stage today. We love you, and we exalt you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So right off the bat, we see in Luke that Jesus is doing something remarkable. He prays all night. I didn't pray all night, by the way, too, before this message. I probably wouldn't have been very, very effective, but Jesus chose to pray all night before he chose the 12. And Jesus sets a powerful example for us in leadership to pray for those we lead which includes, by the way, everyone in this room. You're a leader. You have a sphere of influence that God has placed you in. And we are called to pray for those we serve. One of my seminary professors, Bobby Clinton, this little guy, and he, he challenged each one of us. He said, if God calls you to a ministry, you pray for that ministry. And each of you, each one of us have been called to a ministry. You may not, you may not be aware of that, but you've each been called to a ministry and God calling you to pray for that ministry. Jesus sets an amazing example right off the bat. Now, after Jesus prayed all night, he then called all the people, men and women, who were following him. Think of them as the little D disciples, okay? And even from among this larger group, Jesus then selects 12. 12 representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and we typically think of them as the big D disciples. I don't know if they had sweatshirts that said big D, but they were chosen as the disciples. And he chose the 12 disciples to also be called his apostles. You may have heard that term. It comes from this Greek word apostoli, which means sent ones. So right from the beginning, Jesus marks the purpose for this group to learn to be like him, a disciple. A disciple means learner. And to be sent by him, an apostle. To learn to be like him, and to learn to be sent by him. So the first observation that we have about the good news of the kingdom of God is this. Jesus chooses the unexpected. He chooses the unexpected. He chooses an unexpected group of disciples to follow him. I mean, including middle-class fishermen, a partial Greek, a religious zealot who hated the Romans, a Jewish, collector, a Jewish tax collector who worked for the Romans, and even a man who would eventually betray his rabbi, his teacher. They had diverse personalities, diverse egos, social status, and expectations of Jesus. They were just ordinary men with no special training. But the one thing that set them apart was that they were chosen by Jesus, and they were with Jesus, chosen by him and with him chosen by him and with him. And this gives us a glimpse into the good news of the kingdom of God. No matter your religious background, no matter your education, your resume, no matter if you're young, you're old, no matter what you've done, no matter even how you feel about yourself, Jesus chooses the unexpected to be with him, to learn from him, and to reveal his kingdom to the world. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel unworthy or unqualified to be chosen by Jesus to follow him? Unworthy, unqualified? If you do, I want to say welcome. You're among friends. You're welcome to a bunch of diamonds in the rough, a room of ragamuffins, the island of misfit toys. The gathering of the broken and busted up. You're just who Jesus is looking for. You're just who Jesus is looking for. You are chosen by Jesus, and that's good news. Let's continue in verses 17 to 19. By the way, just keep your Bibles open, because we're going to be in all of Luke 6. 
He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and all the people tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Jews and Gentiles came from all over the place to be near Jesus. The region of Judea and Jerusalem, mostly those would have been Jews, but also said these seacoast towns that are in Phoenicia, and that's about 50 miles away, and that surely indicates that there would be Gentiles with them, and they walked for miles. They didn't get an Uber, they had to walk. <laughs> and they were desperate to hear Jesus and to be healed by Jesus, physically and spiritually. So another observation that we make about the kingdom of God is that Jesus heals the unexpected. He healed all who touched him. Did you notice that? Verse 19, it says, power was coming from him and healing them all. He healed all who touched him. And in an instant, bodies were restored. Souls were freed from evil spirits. Must have been powerful just to watch that happening right before your eyes. So the good news of the kingdom of God is about full restoration in all dimensions, physically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, body, soul, and mind. Now how, you guys know this, how and when Jesus heals, it's a mystery. His ways, his timing, it's beyond our comprehension. And he's no cosmic vending machine, like you can just put in a quarter and just select, I want healing now, and it's going to happen. It doesn't work like that. But the truth is, Jesus still heals. He healed then, and he heals today. I'm a living testimony of that in many ways. So here's another question. Are you desperate? Are you desperate for the healing touch of Jesus today? Desperate, are you? Reach out by faith. Jesus heals the unexpected. That's good news. He heals the unexpected. How are we doing? You ready for some more good news? Okay. The verse 20 begins with what has been traditionally called the Sermon on the Plain, which comes from what Luke says when Jesus was on a level place in verse 17, the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain is related to the Sermon on the Mount, which is from Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Now, Luke's account is about 30% of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there's a lot of similarities to it. But I want you to picture, I want you to imagine yourself there. Again, you've walked for days to hear and see Jesus. And, and you've been hearing about this Jesus. Who is this guy? You may be wondering, what has this carpenter of Nazareth got to say to me? And could he be, could he be the one that people have been praying about? We've been waiting for this promised Messiah. Could he be the one? And you're about to hear there's nothing plain about the Sermon on the Plain. You're about to hear teaching that is chocked full of unexpected good news in the kingdom of God. Let's look at verses 20 to 23. Looking at his disciples, and I picture, I picture him kind of turning and, and looking at his disciples, and he says these words. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and, and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. The opening of this sermon is traditionally referred to as the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes, which comes from this Latin phrase, beatisunt, or blessed are. The word blessed, it's really different from what we people call blessed in our culture today. 
if you hear somebody say, I'm blessed, they're probably talking about how much money they've got, health, uh, maybe they've got fame, talent. I'm blessed. That is not what Jesus was saying here. Jesus uses the term blessed as he describes a state of spiritual well-being and prosperity that's not tied to your circumstances. That's not tied to the ups and downs of life. Here's another observation. Jesus blesses the unexpected. He blesses the unexpected. The Beatitudes are unexpected blessings for those who belong to the kingdom of God. The qualities and experiences of those Jesus called blessed demonstrates this great reversal and upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. Are you poor, hungry, weeping, hated, excluded, insulted, scorned? Jesus sees you. He sees you. He understands because he's experienced all of these. Jesus declares to his disciples, the kingdom is yours. You will be satisfied. You will laugh. You will leap for joy. For great reward awaits you. You are blessed regardless of your circumstances. The Apostle Paul illustrates this best in Philippians 4, 11 and 12. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of contentment in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul learned the secret secret of contentment in any and every situation. Paul embraced this blessing of knowing that Jesus, no matter what happened to him, it would bring him great joy. Jesus will bring him great joy. So let me ask you again. Are you poor? Hungry? Weeping? Hated? Excluded? Insulted? Scorned? Jesus declares the kingdom is yours. It's yours. And Jesus blesses the unexpected. And you guys, that's just good news, right? It's so good. Let's go back to the Sermon on the Plain, verses 24 to 27. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and joy. Woe to you now when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Whoa, time out, Ron. I thought you said today was all about good news. Well, it is. <laughs> it's just, it's how we look at what does he mean by woe. This Greek word for woe is oai, O-U-A-I. And it means deep grief and sorrow, not a threat, not punishment. Jesus warns the unexpected. It's a warning. And he, Jesus warns his disciples and grieves when we base our happiness on our own comfort and the praise of others in this earthly life. Sorrow awaits us when our short-sightedness keeps us from the real blessings of the kingdom of God. These woes, friends, have led me to ask some really hard questions over the last few weeks. Maybe you can relate to some of them. Where am I placing too much emphasis on the things of this world? Where do I still live for the praise and approval of others? How is comparison to others robbing me of joy? Hard questions. The things of this world and the approval of others will not satisfy our deepest longings. Paul said it in Colossians 3.2, set your minds that are on things above, not on the things that are on earth. Jesus' warnings are unexpected good news for us to recenter on the things above 
not on his kingdom and not on the things of this earth. So by the way, if Jesus' words made you start to squirm a little bit in your seat, uh, buckle up, friends. It's not going to get any easier. <laughs> Verses 27 to 36. But to you who are listening, I hope you're listening. I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Give to everyone who asks of you. Lend to others without expecting to be repaid back. Yep. Jesus loves the unexpected. Enemies, haters, cursers, bullies, cheaters, they don't expect to be loved. And that's the unexpected good news of the kingdom of God. And if you think that we are better than them, well, think again. Paul says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or as the late great evangelist Billy Graham simply said, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus expects his disciples to love the unexpected, to be merciful to others, just as your father is merciful to you. And when we do, he promises that our reward will be great. We will be children of the most high God, the one who is kind to the ungrateful and wicked, the one who is merciful to us. Friends, there's, there's no wiggle room in the teaching of Jesus. There's no mincing of words. He calls each one of us to live as he lives, to love as he loves. We're his ambassadors. We're, we're his representatives. We're his witnesses. And that is the essence of being a disciple. Ready for some more unexpected teaching? For this part of Jesus' sermon, I, I want to invite you to close your eyes and invite the Holy Spirit to highlight something you need to hear. Think of it like a spiritual highlighter. So close your eyes and listen to Jesus' words starting in verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Keep your eyes closed. What correction did you need to hear from Jesus? If 
you can open your eyes. Maybe you didn't expect today to come to church and be corrected by Jesus, but the truth is Jesus corrects the unexpected. He corrects us all with the same motivation he had for those initial disciples. He corrects us out of love. He corrects us out of love. Teachers correct. Teachers show us the right way. And as Jesus said, the student is not above his teacher. Our training on this earth, it's never over. And that's unexpected good news. Our training's never over. And Jesus' standard for his disciples is to be like the teacher, to be like him. So what's expected for his disciples is following the unexpected way of Jesus. The unexpected way is the expected way of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God appears to be this radical way of life, but it's really meant to be a normal way of life. It seems upside down, but it's meant to be right side up. It's not an insane way to live, but extremely sane. Not seen with the naked eye, but very real. Not fair, oftentimes, but it's just. Not politically correct, but absolutely true. Not someone's opinion, but God's holy word. Not some vain platitudes, but God-formed practices. Not the heart of the world, but the heart of our Father. Not the cultural norm, but the standard of the Almighty. Not your little kingdom, not my little kingdom, but his kingdom alone. The way of Jesus seems completely unexpected, but it's absolutely expected for his followers. And Chris, if you want to come up whenever you're ready. In this chapter, we've seen that Jesus chooses the unexpected, heals the unexpected, blesses the unexpected, warns the unexpected, loves the unexpected, and corrects the unexpected. And he expects his disciples to do the same so that we can bear fruit and live solid lives. Verses 43 to 47. No tree bears, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As far as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundations on rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Good fruit, a solid foundation. These are powerful outcomes for Jesus' disciples to follow his unexpected good news. And yet, let's face it, this seems like an impossible idea, right? I mean, how are we really supposed to be like Jesus? How are we supposed to live according to this kingdom ethic, these standards that are even greater than the law itself? The truth is we can't on our own. We can't in our own strength, in our own willpower. So we end our time where we began this morning in our reading in prayer. And it's through prayer that we confess we cannot do anything on our own in the kingdom of God. We, through prayer, we surrender our lives to Jesus and live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through prayer, Jesus calls us to listen to his words and to put them into practice. Through prayer, we are called to trust, to obey. Through prayer, we come expectant for the unexpected way of Jesus who expects us as his disciples to, believe, to live like him. So we wanted to give you an extended time of just quiet prayer and reflection in response to Jesus 
So while Chris plays, there will be some related questions to consider on the screen. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to highlight at least one of them to focus on this morning. The others you can use later this week in prayer. And these questions are going to be coming up on the, on the screen. First one is, what does it mean to me to be chosen by Jesus? What healing do I need from Jesus? How am I blessed by Jesus in spite of my circumstances? Where in my life do I trust in something more than Jesus? Who am I called to love like Jesus who least expects it, expect it? Who am I judging? And what do I need to surrender to Jesus? And I just want to give the opportunity and, and, and Andrew at the very end, but maybe today you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Why not today? We had a bunch of kids. We just heard an amazing story of some kids who were given that opportunity. Why not today? Friends, let us repent what's expected in the world. Let's take Jesus' words to heart and put them into practice. And when we do, Jesus promises that our lives will bear fruit and be built on a solid foundation. Oh 
God in their souls are songs of the kingdom of God and they will find a refuge for theirs is the kingdom of God Let's all stand together as we wrap up our time this morning. I want to pray for all of us. Before we are done with this morning, I want to make sure, like Ron said, to make space for you. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you have not been born again and welcomed into his kingdom, the invitation is open today. Every single one of us is made by God to be in relationship with him. Every single one of us has sinned and turned away from him. But in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, we all have the opportunity to come to God, receive forgiveness of our sins, be born again, and be welcomed into his kingdom, to live with him today and forever. I'm going to invite all of us to bow our heads and close our eyes. If you're here this morning and you need to be freed from the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of light, or if you maybe have followed Jesus and drifted and you need to come back to him this morning, I want to invite you to do that, to make that decision this morning. And you can pray a prayer, something like this. Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you raised from the dead. I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I'm asking that you would forgive all of my sins you make me born again into your kingdom right now. And would you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can know you and follow you today and be with you forever. Lord, I pray for all of us here this morning that we would follow you every day. We pray that our hearts would be soft. We pray, Lord, that we would know how desperate we are for you, how hungry and thirsty we are. We pray that we would be people who come to you, come near to you every day, throughout the day. We pray, God, that we would build our lives on your word, that we would bear fruit, your fruit, your kingdom fruit for your glory. We pray, God, that we would be your ambassadors to the world around us. 
We want to know you. We want to make you known, Lord Jesus. We pray that we would believe this good news and that as we go out into our workplaces, neighborhoods, homes, families, friendships, everywhere we go this week, would you baptize us in the Holy Spirit? Fill us with power to be your witnesses everywhere that we go. We pray that we would be bold with the kingdom of God, that we would live in it and we would share it with those that we come in contact with this week. We pray that as your church, you would build us together, that we would strengthen one another in the Holy Spirit, that we would encourage one another in the race that you have marked out for us. So as we go this morning, Lord, would you fill us? Would you send us out? Keep us near to you this week. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said, amen.